Hey everyone, I'm back with part 2 of this new series where I analyse each area of Jack and Daxter and go over what does and doesn't work. In my last video, I went in depth about the tutorial stage, Guys Rock, as well as took a brief look at Jack's moveset. If you haven't seen that one, go watch that, I'll link the video below. So before I talk about all the individual levels and what they have to offer, I wanted to talk about the way the game itself works, as well as some of the content that's present throughout every level. First off, let's talk about the way the game world works and is structured. So Jack and Daxter's world is just that, a world. Unlike all other 3D platformers at the time and previous to it, Jack and Daxter's world has zero load times, which was extremely impressive for the time and a big draw point for the game. What this means is that the player can walk from any area of the game to another without any waiting times or slowdowns or having the screen cut to black. The only exceptions are Misty Island and Snowy Mountain. These however are still technically not loading screens due to the fact that these cutscenes are still in engine and never cut to black. Something a lot of people, myself included, have said to describe how the world works is that as long as they have progressed far enough into the story, the player can run all the way from the start of the game straight to the very end without a single load time or black screen to stop them. So with all that said, how is the game structured? Well, that's where the villages come into play. The way the game is structured is there is a hub area for each major story revelation in the game. These villages are what connects the different areas or levels together to make the world feel seamlessly connected. For example, the first hub area, Sandover Village, is accessible after the player finishes the tutorial. So here the player can explore this village and what it has to offer. Then they can walk down this path and they've reached the beach area. Or they can follow this path and explore the jungle area. Or if they've completed the required task, they can take this boat here to the far off island and explore there. Finally, once the player has the required amount of power cells, they can take this path to find the fire canyon which is the pathway to the next village with its own layout, setting, and different areas to explore. The player is only allowed to explore these villages and surrounding areas as long as they have collected the required amount of power cells to progress to that area. There are three of these hub areas or villages in the game, and they all have very similar traits, but all share the same purpose of connecting all the areas together for seamless transitions from area to area. So let's quickly take a look at each of these areas and see how they're similar and what they have to offer. First up is Sandover Village. This is the first hub area of the game, and I gotta say, it's really nice. This one is probably my favourite of the three. So, this is Jack and Daxter's village, the one they grew up in. It's also home to Kira and Samos, as well as a whole bunch of other inhabitants. That's probably what I like most about this village, the fact that it really feels like a little town. You've got Samos and Kira, who live in the biggest and coolest hut because they're important and stuff. Then you've got the fisherman's house, who isn't there, he's in a different area with an objective for you to complete. Then you've got the mayor's house, which is massive with this big windmill thing on it, which is part of a quest. Then you've got Jack's uncle's house, who's an explorer in his older age. Then you've got the sculptor, then the bird watcher lady, and the farmer. Each of these NPCs have something for you to do, whether it be something simple or something that requires you to complete something in another level. They all have a lot of character and all have their own personalities. This of course isn't exclusive to the first village, but there's just so many more NPCs here than the other two hub areas, and I really like it. The visuals of the area are also really nice, and it just has a really nice vibe to it that makes you wish you could explore it yourself in real life. And to really complement the visuals and the design of the area is the music. This village again uses the main theme of the game as the music, but what's really awesome is the way it changes depending on where Jack is in the village. For example, if I were to walk from here to the fisherman's hut, the music would change from the main normal Sandover village music to the Sandover village music fisherman mix. And it does this for all the NPCs and their huts, which makes the music really feel fresh and interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, the surrounding areas where the actual gameplay occurs are Sentinel Beach, the Forbidden Jungle, Misty Island, and the Fire Canyon. The last one is only accessible once the player has collected 20 power cells and will lead them to the next hub area. Now, let's talk about the power cells of the level. Right off the bat, I'm just going to say that for each of these hub areas, the power cells are all pretty much identical. For Sandover Village we have, bring 90 orbs to Mayor. This is very self-explanatory and is the most common and repeated objective for all of these hub areas. Simply collect 90 orbs and bring them to the inhabitants that require them. The Mayor wants the orbs to fund his re-election campaign, which personally I wouldn't vote for him. I, I don't know, I, 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 I'm got, ooh. 
Maybe I should raise taxes to to pay for this mess. Bring 90 orbs to your uncle. Jack's uncle pledged his word that he would have 90 orbs, presumably to other explorers, but that Jack's your young friend, you know, the little annoying, miserably ugly one, might have just pilfered them as a sort of a spot of fun. So he asks if he can have 90 orbs to get on the way in exchange for a power cell. Herd the Yakows into their pen. This is probably the only unique objective for all of the hub areas. For this one, the farmer is having trouble getting his Yakows into their pen. So, how do we help him out? We beat the shit out of his cattle. I mean, you don't have to, you can simply walk behind them and guide them into a boot. <laughs> Anyway, it's just a simple little distraction for a power cell. The Yakals are spread around the area and you have to find them and lead them into the pen. They are pretty simple to lead around, hitting them gets them there a bit faster and also motivates them if they stop or don't initially head towards the pen. Once all five have returned to their pen, the farmer awards you a power cell. All in all, it's a decent mission for the early stages of the game. Due to its simplicity and the fact that it's a very early mission, there isn't really anything to critique it on. Personally, I find that kind of boring, but at least it's over quick, and it really adds to the vibe of the place, having some kind of event that's happened off screen in the day-to-day -day life of one of the villages. So it's kind of boring, but I wouldn't want it removed. Next we have... Bring 120 orbs to the Oracle. Times two. This is exactly the same as the 90 orbs missions mentioned before, except instead of villagers needing 90 orbs for some random reason, it's these oracles that won 120 just cause. These oracles are present in all three hub areas and always spout some stuff before just saying, give me 120 for each. There's two power cells to be obtained from these in each hub area. And finally we have... Free 7 Scout Flies. This power cell is the final one on the list for each and every area, and it doesn't really have much to comment on. Just collect all the Scout Flies and you've got a power cell. I'll probably point out specific bullshit ones if I come across them, but for the most part, I'll just list the power cell and move on. So, Sandover Village is a great hub area, probably my favourite. Great vibes, music, and it feels alive with all the villages. Granted, it could feel a lot more alive if there were people wandering around or something, but that will kind of just take away from it a bit. So, with Sandover Village out of the way, let's look at the next hub area, Rock Village. Rock Village is accessible once the player has progressed through Fire Canyon after having collected 20 or more power cells. The vibe of this hub is such a stark opposite from the last, which I think is a real strong point for it. The atmosphere is so bleak and depressing. There's a constant storm, the village is in ruins due to a massive lurker monster, Claw, terrorising it, and the music just adds to it so much. Gone is the upbeat and relaxing tunes of the previous village. This one is hallowing and dreary and will send a chill down your spine. Just like the last village, there are NPCs to interact with, who each have their own problems and personalities. There are considerably less though. This time we have the archaeologist, who studies rocks and lightning moles. The warrior, who tried to defend the village from the monster destroying it, but lost terribly and the gambler, who lost his pants when betting on the warrior to win the fight. All three are great however, and especially the latter two, are a lot more memorable than most people from the last village. And just like before, the music changes slightly depending on what part of the area you're at, or what NPC you're hanging around. The overall look and design is also really nice. The first thing the player will come across is the Blue Sage's hut, which resides next to a waterfall atop a big rock. The entire village is surrounded by water, and there's quite a few waterfalls which just adds to the atmosphere. In the centre of it all, there's a little area where two of the NPCs hang around, along with some seats and some fire pits. But if we go right as we enter, not only is this the path to one of the levels that we'll explore later on, but there's some tables and chairs and some crockery, and it's just a nice little touch which I quite enjoy. And then, if we look at this area from when we first enter the hub, we'll see that it's part of a gigantic rock, and if we look up, see that there are a heap of houses lodged into the sides of it, some of which are on fire and destroyed thanks to Claw. This massive stone structure is just so fucking cool, and I really wish we could explore it.
There is just too much detail to it that it has any right to have. Around the village are also some giant flaming boulders that have wreaked havoc onto the village, and you can hear the flames burning away, which is such a cool little touch. Here's something you probably didn't know, I certainly didn't for a long time. If we go right here to this bridge and jump off of either side of it, instead of falling into the water and likely getting eaten by the loka shark, you'll fall onto these small platforms where you can jump back to safety. Why are these here? Hell if I know, but what I love about this game is you could play through it hundreds of times and still find small things like this that you've never noticed before. So the surrounding areas where the actual gameplay takes place are the Precursor Basin, the Lost Precursor City, and Boggy Swamp. Honestly, I think these three will be some of the most interesting episodes of this series. Then the last one is Mountain Pass, which is like the Fire Canyon, as it links this hub with the next one. This one requires 45 or more power cells to progress. So, let's take a quick look at the power cells. Bring 90 orbs to the Gambler. So, the Gambler lost his pants when betting on the Warrior to win the fight between him and Claw. So, he wants 90 orbs to get himself back on his feet and out of the barrel he's using for pants, which is fair enough. Bring 90 orbs to the Geologist. The Geologist is studying lightning moles over in the Precursor Basin, not too far from the village. So, when asking Jack and Daxter to help out the moles, Daxter demands two power cells for the task, which she replies that she'd exchange another power cell for 90 orbs to fund her research equipment. Bring 90 orbs to the Warrior. So, after the Warrior's failed battle against Claw, he pulled the pontoon bridge apart in an effort to prevent him from going down to the village and attacking him again. But in order to progress to the mountain pass and boggy swamp, we needed the bridge to be restored, so the warrior offers to fix the bridge for 90 orbs. But a power cell is never mentioned in this conversation, and you just kind of get one, just because. Bring 120 orbs to the oracle, times two. Which is exactly the same as before. And finally, free seven scout flies. So, Rock Village is a pretty awesome area with such a great tone and atmosphere. That's something this game can pull off really well, a great atmosphere, as you'll see in some of the later episodes of the series. With Rock Village out of the way, let's take a quick look at the final hub area, the Volcanic Crater. Once you've proceeded through the mountain pass, you'll enter the Volcanic Crater. As you enter, the first thing you're greeted to is the Red Sage's Hut, resting above a pit of lava that engulfs the entire area. So, right off the bat, there are way less NPCs than the other two hubs. We went from five in Sandover Village, to three in Rock Village, to just two here. I guess it makes sense, I mean, who would live in a place like this? These two are Gordy and Willard. These guys are trying to get this massive priceless gem out of this cave so they can make a fortune. When Jack and Daxter confront them, Daxter explains they want power cells, not gems. Gordy explains they may have some power cells and they might be willing to part with them for 90 orbs each. Where have I heard that before? These two are pretty entertaining. Gordy is a bit of an ass, and Willard is just an idiot. And the banter between the two is very entertaining. As for the rest of the level, well, where do I begin? Let's start with the design and overall look. For the most part, it's pretty good, if a bit uninspired. Most of what you'll be looking at is orange, so it can be a bit tiring. Luckily, not too much time is spent here, as it's just the hub area, so it's not too bad. The layout of the area kinda really sucks though. So, as you first arrive, you cross a bridge to the Red Sage's hut, and another bridge to a rock area where you can walk. Here, you can walk straight into the cave where the two miners are, or you can walk left for a short path to the oracle for this hub. Turning right from the bridge, however, you'll come across the gondola that takes you to another level. But walking past that are some platforms and then a series of minecarts on tracks that you have to ride to get around. And it's really, really slow and boring. So there are three sets of tracks. If you go around the first one, you get to the lava tube, which is the bridge level like the mountain pass previous to this. If the carts were only here to bring the player to Lava Tube, that would be fine. But instead, we have another two sets of tracks to ride. The middle one has some precursor orbs on it, but you don't collect them on the way to the level you're trying to get to, you collect them on your way back, which is kinda annoying. Then the third one is the one that takes you to the level you're trying to get to, which is Spider Cave. The whole trip just trying to get to Spider Cave is so slow and boring. Something to make this less of a slog would be to keep the first track there, cause that one works fine just to get to Lava Tube. Then next to that, have some sort of platforming challenge that leads you to Spider Cave, and have those precursor orbs scattered throughout the platforms. This would be a lot better than just waiting around trying to get there. Some might argue that it's a nice change of pace and it gives you a bit of time to breathe, but while yes it is, so is the trip up to Snowy Mountain, so I'm sure they could have made this trip a bit more engaging. 
So that is the main complaint I have and many others have with this area. So let's look at the rest of the level. The music for this area is, as always, very nice. It has a sense of isolation and sounds quite industrial, which works quite well given the setting. Like the other two hubs, the music changes slightly depending on where you are. The overall vibe of the level is nice, but not as memorable as the other two. One little detail I really like though, is with the tracks for the minecarts. If you look at the wooden planks on the tracks, there are a lot missing, so you can't just walk along them without the risk of falling into the lava and dying. But if we look at the track right at the entrance to Spider Cave, all the planks of wood are intact. So it's the lava that was damaging the tracks, but when there's no lava underneath, it's fine. And I think that's a nice little touch they really didn't have to put in. So, the levels for this hub are the Snowy Mountain and the Spider Cave. The linking level for this area is the Lava Tube, which requires 72 power cells to access and progress to the final area. So, let's take a very quick look at the power cells. Bring 90 orbs to the miners, times 4. So, the miners have 4 power cells up for sale. Not really any reason other than we need them, and they don't want to give them away for nothing. Something to note here is that for the first 3 cutscenes, it's exactly the same. Not much else to say here. Bring 120 orbs to the oracle, times 2. Hey guys, just a pancake, I mean power cell freak here, the number one channel for fucking up Jack and Daxter videos. And it's time for me to tell you that I am a fucking idiot because I forgot to include the next power cell in my script and therefore didn't record the voiceover for it. So here goes. Find a hidden power cell. This is a bit of a tricky one. In order to get this one, you have to first go into one of the actual levels, Spider Cave. Here, you will need to obtain some yellow echo. So you jump up here and power up, then jump down and run out of the level. Once you exit, shoot the yellow echo. It will then target the crate the power cell is in, and break it. Then you get a power cell. It's a good mission. It requires the player to think outside the box and try something they wouldn't normally do. It's good. Free seven scout flies. So, Volcanic Crater is okay. It gets the job done, but it's nothing really outstanding. The music fits the level really well, and Gordy and Willard are pretty entertaining. Not too much to say here, though. Okay, so now that we've gotten all that out of the way, there's just a couple little things I wanted to address that doesn't really fit into any other video. First off, let's talk about the enemies. Each of the levels, aside from the hub areas and the levels that link the hubs, have their own unique enemies. All these enemies fit the themes and locations of the level, which helps make each area feel fresh and different from the last. Most enemies go down in one hit and aren't too different from each other. However, there are quite a few that have completely unique behaviours and phases. For the most part, the enemies are implemented pretty well, considering that combat isn't a main focus of the game like the sequels. I'll go through each and every enemy as we come across them in each level. Another quick thing I wanted to talk about was the day and night cycle. So, as you're playing the game, just like in real life, the world will slowly turn from day to night and everything in between, which is an awesome feature and it just makes some areas look beautiful. And another quick thing is dying. This game came out just after the era of Crash and Spyro, and those games had lives, so if the player died, they would lose a life, and if they lost all of them, it would be game over. With Jack and Daxter, there is no life system, meaning you can die and fuck up as many times as you want without any worry. And better yet, when you die, you respawn almost instantly, just to try again. On the topic of dying, if the player ever swims out too far, they will be eaten and killed by the lurker shark. This is in place so the player doesn't go outside of the game's boundaries. There are, of course, plenty of safe spots to swim in the game, like when the water is very shallow or you're very close to land, but generally large bodies of water means you're going to get eaten. 
Checkpoints are another thing. Every level has checkpoints, with some more than others. I'll go over each one in the level as I come to them. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything I need to cover. I felt the need to make this video to explain how the game itself works before diving into the nitty gritty of every mission in each level. This way, if there's something that needs explaining, I don't have to get sidetracked in another video trying to explain the concept and only doing it half assed in order to try and move on. So the next episode will be Sentinel Beach, the first real area of the game with actual challenges and enemies to fight. So I'll see you guys then, thanks for watching.